So, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to CSIS. Thank you for joining us today. We're very happy to have uh, two of the most prominent ambassadors in Washington here with us today, Ambassador Haba of Germany and Ambassador Etienne of France. Um, judging by the crowd, I can see there's a high level of interest in what they might have to say, uh, whether that's on foreign policy, security policy, or economics and trade. So I will, I will be brief. We're going to set this up as more of a conversation. Uh, so we have time for a lot of discussion and, and can reach a lot of topics. Uh, but in terms of, of introductions, I was going over your biographies and I was struck by some of the similarities. I'll mention just three because I think they speak to the depth of the experience of the two ambassadors here on stage. The first is both our career diplomats, having served in ministries of foreign affairs, embassies abroad, in the case of Ambassador Haba and the Ministry of Interior, experience in international organizations like the OSCE and the European Union. So very broad, uh, robust career diplomat uh, backgrounds. Secondly, both of you served in Moscow, uh, which I think will probably serve you well uh, given the space that Russia fills in a lot of our discussions. Uh, and thirdly, Western Balkans experience, including a speaker of Serbo-Croatian. Uh, I will not elaborate who that is, but uh, very impressive experience that is certainly relevant to the EU's immediate neighborhood as well as further abroad. Um, Ambassador Haba, prior to joining us here in Washington in June 2018, uh, was deployed to, as I said, the Ministry of Interior, where she was State Secretary. Uh, she has worked closely with the U.S. in that capacity in fight against international terrorism, as well as cyber attacks and cybersecurity. Prior to that, she was the political director as well as the state secretary in the Foreign Office, and I'm proud to say the first woman uh, to hold either post. Earlier in her career, uh, she worked in the OSCE. Uh, she was the deputy head of the Cabinet and Parliamentary Liaison Division and the Director General for the Western Balkans. Uh, she has a broad background in so the Soviet Union and Russia and worked in the Soviet Union Division of the German Foreign Office, as well as I said, the Germany, German Embassy in Moscow. Um, Ambassador Etienne uh, has also a very long distinguished career in his Ministry of Europe, European and Foreign Affairs, including Ambassador of France to Romania, Director of the Cabinet of the Minister of Foreign and European Affairs, the Permanent Representative of France to the European Union, Ambassador of France to Germany, with an impressive German language skills as well, I heard earlier, as well as diplomatic advisor to the president. Um, lots of posts around Europe um, and, and a background, um, not just in foreign policy, but mathematics and economics as well. So between the two of them, I'm sure we can have a very broad uh, discussion ranging a lot of different topics. So without further ado, I'll offer the stage or the chair first to Ambassador Haba for some opening remarks and then Ambassador Etienne and then we'll move to a moderated discussion. I don't know, can you hear me? No. Okay, well, I'll just try uh, and you'll have to shout and tell me uh, uh, that something has to be done about the acoustics if need be. So whenever I talk about uh, Europe here, the way Americans frame it is you're at a crossroads. Um, a lot of pessimism uh, is, um, is <coughs> blatantly obvious in the questions, to which I usually say um, Europe has always been at crossroads. Um, the Europe uh, that emerged from the European uh, uh, Commission for Steel um, uh, and Coal was a completely different Europe uh, uh, than integrated Europe, the Europe of, uh, um, of Maastricht, the Europe of, uh, uh, of Lisbon. Ev everything has changed over time, including uh, the narrative or, or the sense of purpose. Imagine the European Commission for Steel uh, uh, and Coal uh, was designed to um, reconstruct Europe uh, and contain and constrain the potential for German power. And if you compare that to, shall we say, the mission statement of today, it would be a completely different uh, one. The mission statement of today would be uh, um, the world has altered, the balance of the world has tilted and not uh, in the favor of the West. Uh, and we need all our collective strength in order to stand our ground and to defend uh, our interests and our values. So if you look at that, it's also true that the past 11 years uh, have been uh, 
have been much impacted uh, by first the euro crisis and then the migration crisis and of course of uh, because of brexit uh, which all of which has made europe very introspective um, though I would say, looking at uh, the uh, euro crisis and the migration crisis, uh, which have led to a loss of confidence, which is obvious uh, in the emergence of populist movements uh, in Europe, uh, but it's a paradox that um, the, uh, both crises have led to the uh, loss of confidence, but at the same time, uh, um, they have strengthened uh, the governance structures which existed uh, and which had been shored up uh, as a consequence uh, and which actually protected uh, Europe and the world uh, uh, from uh, the huge crisis uh, that was, for example, um, which made the difference between the Great Depression of 1929 when everyone was left to his own devices, everyone for his own, uh, and the Great Recession in 2008 where we were protected by governance structures. So I'm just saying all of that because you need to understand, Americans need to understand uh, that it's wrong to extrapolate from both the crisis uh, uh, and uh, 11 years of, uh, well, much inward looking uh, processes. Uh, um, today, um, European elections have a larger participation than they used to have uh, in the past. Uh, all European polls will show uh, you uh, that the European cause uh, has become more popular and that the public engages much more than it used to. So Brexit is by no means a downhill road uh, uh, to uh, some sort of development of Euroscepticism uh, or fragmentation, quite the contrary. So where are we now uh, today? Um, it's obvious that uh, we have a lot of homework to do. Uh, on the internal uh, side, uh, we'll have to uh, make sure that uh, Europe grows more resilient uh, and that we uh, develop resistance against uh, economic shocks and uh, financial shocks. We'll have to do uh, something on youth unemployment, uh, social rights, um, uh, values and uh, rule of law. These were the topics uh, that will confront us uh, in the in the time to, uh, and of course, digitization, uh, um, uh, handling uh, digitization and the impact it will have uh, on our societies, uh, and uh, the impact it will have to have uh, uh, for <coughs> our economies and our uh, capacity uh, uh, to, um, um, well, to protect us, uh, to protect ourselves, uh, and to be uh, competitive. That's on the internal side. On the external side, we'll have to cope with the. Uh, uh, impact of uh, climate change uh, on our societies, on our economies. Uh, we'll have to um, uh, deal uh, with uh, what Americans call uh, uh, the uh, new strategic uh, competitors, uh, by which I mean basically the meteoric uh, rise of China, which will soon be the lar world's largest economy with a huge capacity to impact on the way uh, uh, um, the economy is going to be conducted in the uh, future. We'll have to uh, deal with all the, uh, with, uh, um, the international order uh, or the solutions of parts of it uh, or changes of it. And we'll have to deal with the host of crises uh, in our own geography, which is North Africa, the Middle East, uh, uh, the Sahel Zone, uh, Ukraine. So that's a lot on our plate, as you can easily see. And if you ask me how you will manage it, I will point uh, to the program that the new commission has just adopted, uh, and which is a wide ranging program, uh, um, ranging from dig uh, digitization to uh, climate change uh, and uh, our role uh, in the security and foreign policy field. Now, usually, uh, uh, if the commission is mentioned, many Americans uh, tell me, uh, well, that's the commission. But that's where you get it wrong. The commission wouldn't have put forward the program if it hadn't consulted it with all capitals and with the parliament. So the program that has been put forward is actually reflecting a general consensus 
that would uh, include member states, capitals, uh, and, uh, and parliaments. Now, let me just turn uh, to the um, German-French relationship uh, uh, for a moment. Uh, Philippe um, has worked on it and has worked on uh, European decisions uh, in his past career, as we've heard. So this is an issue where you actually uh, have been incredibly close, and I know it's also close to your heart. Uh, um, the German-French relationship, um, which has undergone changes too, leading up to the Treaty of Aachen, which was concluded uh, uh, last year, but it's always been uh, at the heart of the European Union. Now, usually people look at the differences that we have, which I think is the wrong way of framing it. Uh, yes, we have a lot of differences. Yes, we come from different strategic cultures. Uh, yes, we have different ideas on uh, how to handle uh, the economy. And you know what? That's a good thing. Because the European Union uh, is incredibly diverse. Actually, it's one of its uh, uh, it's one of its riches to be uh, diverse. And if two countries like Germany and France come from different vantage points uh, on crucial issues of our, for our future, then actually we're crossing divides that others are crossing too. It doesn't mean that other countries will not weigh in uh, uh, and present their positions, which they do. But it's it has been in, in the past, and it still is, uh, uh, hugely important for the rest of the European Union that two large countries with different traditions, histories, and vantage points uh, try, to bridge, uh, 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 try to bridge divides, differences, and argue them out, which, was, which we do and which uh, we are, are very good at. Now, when President Macron gave his great speech in Sorbonne in 2017, I'm sure, Philippe, uh, you were um, quite desperate about the slow and hesitant uh, German reaction. It may have uh, 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 been um, not least because of election cycles and uh, timing. But I would say that uh, in uh, uh, the past decades, uh, visions have been um, part of the French tradition, uh, whereas incremental approaches uh, have been more the German thing, which again <laughs> is a good thing uh, because uh, you probably need, uh, you need both. Mm. Now, where does that leave the transatlantic relationship? Just a final and a short word on that. The United States is our closest ally outside of the European Union. It will be our closest ally outside of the European Union along with Britain once the UK uh, uh, leaves the uh, European Union. But the world is changing. As I said, the balance is changing. Uh, uh, the focus uh, is changing because um, the status quo and our values and interests are not being challenged by or in Europe, they're challenged elsewhere. And this will mean uh, that Europe will have to adapt. Countries in Europe and in NATO will have to adapt. It will mean a larger share uh, within NATO uh, uh, in, uh, in terms of defense budgets. It will mean a greater coherence uh, um, uh, of our European defense uh, uh, capabilities, and it can only be in the American interest uh, if, Europe, uh, if the European Union uh, is strengthening its home base uh, and uh, um, carrying uh, part of the burden there as well. And it will mean uh, um, additional uh, efforts, diplomatic efforts, which range from uh, Northern Africa uh, to Iran, uh, um, uh, uh, and to uh, the Ukraine. Iran, uh, we, as you know, have, uh, um, have uh, activated the dispute resolution mechanism. We do share strategic objectives on Iran, and that is uh, no nuclear program. Uh, um, um, uh, we have to do, uh, do something about the uh, uh, missile uh, program. Uh, the sunset clauses are a problem. But we have differences with the United States on how to do it and uh, whether to do it uh, using the constraints of the JCPOA or whether uh, achieving the objectives by withdrawing from it. Ukraine uh, 
uh, is another issue where, been, uh, where we have been uh, incredibly active in the Normandy uh, format, but also in, uh, uh, in supporting the Ukraine. And the observation is in place that our support, European support for the Ukraine, is five times as large as the American uh, support is. And in terms of sanctions uh, against Russia, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the weight we are uh, uh, carrying uh, is 10 times as large as the economic weight, is 10 times as large as the American uh, one. Uh, the Middle East, uh, well, I'll leave it to the questions later on. Uh, you've seen uh, over the weekend how active uh, uh, we've been uh, in dealing with the crisis uh, in, uh, in Libya. Diplomatic efforts uh, will be uh, something that the European Union uh, and, and Germany and uh, France within the European Union uh, will place a large uh, focus on. I'll leave it at that, uh, but my final sentence would be, uh, in all of this, the transatlantic relationship is key, um, not only in security terms, but also beyond the security uh, paradigm, uh, uh, ranging from uh, dealing with the climate uh, crisis to uh, handling uh, the challenges of digitization. All of these are problems that no country uh, can solve on its own, where we would be uh, in, in, uh, infinitely weaker if we dealt with it uh, on our own, and where we need our collective power for uh, uh, standing our ground and for leveraging our clout. Thank you. Let's go straight to you and then... Uh, thank discussion. you. Thank you very much, Rachel, and thank you, Emily, for what you said. Uh, in, um, indeed, I'm, uh, in my life, in my career, I was very much involved in European affairs and in French-German uh, uh, cooperation. And um, Emily was among the people who helped me very much as I was ambassador of France to Germany some years ago. And she, she had these very important uh, duties in the German federal ministry, interior ministry. It's something for me, I will say it from the outside, which is personal. Because I had the chance of uh, being posted in Bonn in the 1980s, a couple of years before uh, the fall of the Berlin Wall. I had the chance to be introduced to some of the actors of the reconciliation between France and Germany. People like Joseph Rovan or Alfred Grosser, but also in a younger generation with Brigitte Sauzet, who, who was the interpreter in German of the French presidents and became the advisor to Chancellor Schroeder in Berlin. Those people have inspired me a lot. And I think that Emily is completely right to say that Europe and the, the context of the European integration have completely changed. But there is something which must remain from this origin when the people who, are in the hor who have lived in, in the, flesh, the horrors of, 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 the, of World War II, of, the, of what happened during those years, they came out of this and they decided we will reconcile both German and French and also the politicians, Adenauer and Schumann and then Adenauer and de Gaulle. This is very important and this stays something very important. This stays an inspiration for our two countries. I think it's also an inspiration in a broader uh, context also in Europe. And um, this is the reason why we celebrate on the 22nd of January every year the anniversary of the signature of the Elysee Treaty in 1963 between uh, Conrad Adenauer and Charles de Gaulle. And it remains something very important which we have prolonged one year ago with the new bilateral treaty, the Aachen Treaty. But this being said, and being said that for me, Germany and France remain really in the cooperation, in the friendship, uh, a, true, uh, a, a true condition. This cooperation remains, uh, I would say, as of somebody who has studied mathematics, a necessary condition for a successful European integration, of course. And Emily said it, it is not a sufficient condition because all member states in the European Union uh, have their part in the, our decision process. But the fact that we stay, to, that we are able to, uh, to make our own contributions together 
remains something very essential. And I completely um, concur with Emily. It is my own personal experience. Somebody who, well, I, uh, who, who is, uh, uh, feels, I feel so close to Germany, uh, also the language, the culture. We, our contribution to the European integration process is also so important because we come from different horizons, as you said, and we very often we disagree at the beginning when we have to solve an issue. What is the most important is the will, not only of the, the leaders, but also of our nations to, 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 to get to constructive compromises. It is what also the other, I think, people wait for from our countries. Now, and uh, I think you said it also, one of the big, the, the most important stake for us as European Union is really uh, to, to cope with global challenges mm. outside Europe and also to a certain extent inside Europe. And the two are linked because our citizens um, need to be convinced that we are uh, up to the tasks, not only our nations, but also the European Union. We had incredible <coughs> successes across the years. We have built the most important internal market, which is something of an incredible value for our economies, but also, by the way, for businesses from third countries. We have succeeded to have a common, a, a, a European currency. We have started an economic and monetary union. We have, well, we have succeeded to uh, in the reunification of Germany inside the European Union and then to extend the European Union to uh, the, the countries which had suffered from uh, the Soviet um, domination. These are incredible successes which remain today. We have resisted to the financial crisis. I was in Brussels then. We have created some extremely powerful mechanisms of uh, financial solidarity to face uh, this, cri this financial crisis. We, had, we have succeeded in getting breakthroughs uh, in the building up of the economic and monetary union. But still, now, and I, I just repeat what Emilia said, we have this, this test. We are in this new world, and there is a number of <coughs> global challenges which uh, we have, to, we have to, to give answers to. One of them, of course, is the energy and climate transition. Another is the technological revolution. On the top of the big issues, migration and f security and foreign policy and uh, economic union. I would, s I would like to, to say a word on, on, on at least one of them in relation with the United States. France and, and, and Germany, in different ways, are very close allies of the United States through our histories. And uh, we, we, we are grateful to the Americans who have supported after World War II the, the creation and the building up of the European Union, who have understood that it, it, it was also important for the United States. I think that, um, and as G7 Sherpa last year during the French G7 presidency, I felt that also very much. When you consider what G7 represented in the 70s that it was created and what it represents now in the world, the world has changed indeed. The, 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 the different um, um, forces are completely different. And we have to, um, for me, it, is, it would be my, my, my belief, my, uh, my strong belief, I think that the, the success of the European Union in those global challenges will be also a success of the transatlantic relation and of the United States. Uh, because we, we will continue to, uh, to share um, fundamental interests and, and values and as democracies, as market economies. I would take, as I said before, one example, which is a 
digital revolution, because uh, as a complement, something complementary to, I will not come back to the foreign policy issues because Emily has already mentioned them and we can come back to them. Although I would like to say that here too, we, Germany and France, work very, very close together on Sahel, on Ukraine, but we, we may have other occasions to come back to them. I was in Brussels as we have adopted the uh, European uh, General Regulation on the Protection of Private of Data, the GPRD. Uh, I see debates in the United States also on privacy. Um, we have in both, on both sides of the Atlantic a very, a very lively debate on standards, on um, regulations, um, on how to conciliate the freedom of speech and the security of our citizens and to fight against, for instance, terrorist contents on the Internet. I feel that we face uh, indeed in a world where, where the Western democracies are not anymore in a position to set alone the standards as they had done before in the history, we have common challenges. So I, I would like to conclude on this, to repeat that I think that the success of the European integration and um, it is uh, the preamble of the new French-German treaty in, uh, in uh, Arven uh, one year ago uh, which is um, a European Union which is united, efficient, sovereign and strong. It is also the, the need of, the, uh, of a strong transatlantic relation in all fields, including defense, of course. And for the prosperity and the security of the United States, I think that we need a successful European Union. That's two very positive interventions that, that look back over a long period of time on the, rev, uh, uh, on the evolution of not only the French-German relationship, but the transatlantic relationship and the EU. Um, I, I, if I think back to the European Coal and Steel Union, it's incredible how far the EU has come, um, both in terms of peace on the continent and what it projects further afield. I wanted to pick up on some of the points that both of you made. Um, about this, this evolution and how some of the imperfections and the disagreements that, that people focus on are actually healthy and help sort of correct one another's uh, worst tendencies or more extreme ideas. And that's almost the power of consensus and multi, multinational institutions. Of course, the downside of that um, for, for many would be the need to compromise national priorities. Uh, in favor of more European goals or transatlantic goals or global goals. So how do we reconcile this for our publics where we recognize on the one hand that a lot of the solutions to today's problems are collective or combined. At the same time, um, a lot of people both in the United States and Europe are very worried about their day-to-day -day well-being, um, whether it's, you know, jobs or, or social security or personal security um, or futures for, for next generations with regard to climate and other, other pressing issues. When you look at your national agendas and compare them to a European or transatlantic agenda, do you see a lot of synergy or do you see more um, tensions? Um, perhaps I can um I'll tell a personal experience. In 2015, I was, um, as you said, a, um, State Secretary in the Interior Ministry. It was at the height of the migration crisis. And what I witnessed at the time was this, um, what a disconnect between what actually happened, and in Germany it was 10,000, 12,000 people crossing the border every day, um, between um, how people felt about it, whether concerned, worried, enraged, positive, welcoming, and um, between what governments could actually do about it. And this connect, this connect was, I realized at the time, hugely important because governments would say, yes, we, we'll have to solve this problem, but you see, we'll I have to solve it via the European Union because we have uh, open borders in Europe and the external borders uh, 
um, uh, are relevant, so we can't do it on our own. Uh, we'll have to negotiate with Turkey and with other countries, we, et cetera. And people said, hey, but uh, we vote uh, for our governments in, um, in Germany, within German borders, and we hold you accountable for what is happening. And if you point to uh, international law or European law or uh, European governance structures, uh, well, um, for us, that's neither here nor there. We're electing you. So this disconnect was hugely important. And what I realized at the time, and actually the financial crisis is an even better example for that, is that if you don't make people understand that compromises or European governance structures or European law is actually there to protect the citizens, which is the case, um, then uh, you'll, have, um, you'll have this uh, legitimacy uh, uh, gap. Um, and it took us a while to make people understand that European law was actually able to uh, um, channel uh, uh, the uh, challenge, uh, to reduce the numbers, if you like, uh, uh, to uh, negotiate, uh, the structures were to negotiate uh, an agreement uh, with other states. Or take the financial uh, crisis of 2008. Um, it was the governance structures that existed and that were reinforced that prevented uh, the crisis to become as uh, long and hit as hard as the Great uh, Depression in, uh, 20, uh, in 1929 uh, did. So we have to, th the message we need to get out there, and that's what uh, 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 we need to under uh, make people understand, that globalization or uh, um, uh, sourcing out decision making in a way that uh, has democratic legitimacy is the only way to protect the interests of the citizens. That's the crucial challenge. That's what I learned in the, uh, in the migration crisis. Yes, I, I, would, I would like to, to say that since the beginning of the European integration, we have the, the basic idea was to pool sovereignty. It's, the European Union has never been a, an international organization like others. We have European institutions. We have the European law. We have European Court of Justice but who have also European institutions, who have a European Parliament, who have a European Commission, and the new Commission, for instance, has given a, a clear vision of uh, what uh, would be the project, which has been discussed with the heads of state and government. The, the downside of this is it's very complicated, of course, for third countries, even for our citizens, to understand. But we have this uh, legal, institutional, political framework where your question is answered as far as the EU and its nation, nation states are concerned, where compromises are built in a way which uh, allows to take into account the national interests of everybody through a process which is democratic, through governments elected in, in each country and through the European Parliament and the European Commission. So um, it the system has been built from the beginning to, to answer your question in the European Union. Um, but as I said, sometimes it is not perceived this way by our citizens. Mm. And we have always questions about how it works, uh, how, uh, is it efficient, is it legitimate? And this is a, the reason why we give the impression uh, always to Emily said we are. We were inward looking because of the crisis. It's true. We, we, we always look at what we are and we try to convince. And we, for instance, we, uh, we, we, we very often have ex common exercises to reflect together on the future of Europe. We will have it again uh, in a couple of, uh, of months. We'll start something on this. But it is also very important. Mm -hmm. It is very important to, to, to show that we we act together, we are efficient in acting, taking t decisions, but we we'll also together look towards the future. This is uh, something to, to get to what I call constructive compromises, which we do, we contribute French, German to this, but as the EU we do this, uh, it's a, it is a process which is really um, something unique for me. 
could we maybe turn a bit to the transatlantic relationship? Um, because I, I sense in some of the debate about, um, you know, not just, not just a more independent uh, European security and defense identity, but also uh, more freedom of, of decision making or more freedom in terms of economic policy, a bit of a tension uh, between in transatlantic relations. And by that I mean, um, you know, what, how would you like the U.S. ideally to approach things like um, a strengthened EU defense identity or a more independent uh, European foreign policy on issues like Iran or Libya? Ideally, paint, paint for me an ideal picture of how the U.S. responds to Europe's efforts to do more and take on more leadership. Because I really feel like we're at an inflection point now where we're asking Europeans to do more, we the U.S., but we're, we're, we're still a little bit uncomfortable with this evolution uh, in the relationship. Okay. Uh, the first answer is please don't forget uh, that um, the European Union uh, has replaced uh, um, has replaced uh, centuries of wars, which uh, in the last century uh, has uh, um, triggered an American involvement that cost uh, many, many American lives. Uh, and uh, if I hear criticism about uh, trade, uh, I think the question is in place uh, uh, what the costs would be uh, of uh, trade with 28 different uh, um, uh, countries, tra different trade systems, different regulatory systems, and so on. So I would, uh, um, my first point would be, please do realize and don't forget <laughs> about the benefits uh, of the European Union for the United States. My second point is to realize that the European Union is not a bloc uh, which is pitted against uh, American interests. Uh, and the European <coughs> Union is, and every single member of the European Union, uh, um, feels aligned uh, to uh, your interests and to your values. So see us as a strategic asset uh, and not uh, um, as uh, 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 something uh, about and a strategic asset even if we disagree. Then usually we disagree on tactics. We don't disagree on strategic, we, uh, 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 on strategies. We don't uh, disagree on what we want to stand for. We don't disagree on values. Uh, we are um, probably in the world, uh, the most aligned partner, ca setting Canada aside, uh, uh, that you have. Um, um, my fourth point would be, if we st strengthen our home ground, if we develop uh, uh, defense uh, capabilities, see that as part of a burden-sharing exercise, which is incredibly necessary because of the changing balance of the world and because uh, of geopolitics, uh, your focus will be shifting, uh, which we see, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, in instances of uh, disengagement, which leaves voids which will have to be covered. So these are my four points. Perfect. I would say a word on defense. Um, we have in our treaties, European treaties, the idea of a, of a common foreign policy and a progressive build-up of a defense policy as an objective. What, what, we, what we hear from the United States is completely understandable, a better burden sharing. We have, since the 90s, since crisis on the, on the European continent, which uh, we Europeans should have been able to solve by our own, and it was not possible and also in our neighborhood. So we, we cannot refuse to consider in cases where the United States, in the framework of our transatlantic <coughs> alliance, would say, this is not for me, it's for you. So we have to, to, to accept this argument. But of course, to, to retain our alliance. And I think you're right when you say, on the one hand, um, it's, um, it's okay for the US that we build our own capacities, but uh, on the other hand, you feel on the US side a sort of um, questioning about where we are going to and so on. We, we must find um, um, in 
and it, it will come well progressively of course because we are we Europeans who are building up progressively we take we have taken especially uh, my president has made also in this field some proposals which uh, we are implementing now mm -hmm. uh, so we we must explain this to our American partner but basically it goes really in the direction which the United States has kept asking for we are developing we are increasing our national budgets. We are uh, building common instruments. All this is complementary to the alliance and consistent with it. And so we are able to do things like France, with the support of Germany and other European states, is doing in Sahel. Why France? Because we were closer to it. And we, but the, this historically, geographically, but what we are military are doing together with the, with the support of other European nations, including Germany, and with the support of the United States. Uh, but we are at the forefront. It's the fight against uh, terrorist movements in the very vulnerable regions. It's the interest of everybody. So I, I will take this example as a French ambassador, of course, because I am personally interested. But I can tell you that we had uh, French-German initiatives on the Sahel last year in G7. And we do it both with uh, a strong European dimension and with a strong uh, dimension, uh, transatlantic dimension. So I think it is, uh, it is a good example to answer your question. Wonderful answers. Thank you. Um, maybe turning a bit to uh, the relationship with the United Kingdom. That's another important partner of, of the European Union, particularly on the security and defense side. I believe the figure I usually hear is that after the UK leaves the European Union, some 70% of NATO's spending and capabilities will be by non-EU members. Um, and then you also alluded to the fact that you know, Germany and France complement one another in terms of, you know, maybe a, a bit more um, of a vision versus a bit more pragmatism and incrementalism. I, I think Emily said that. Emily said that. She said that. <laughs> but you wouldn't agree. <laughs> um, I, I think we. There see are visions also on the German side. Yeah, he was. He didn't we accept are, the self-criticism. We are a bit less efficient, uh, <laughs> maybe on the implementing side. Yeah, you, you almost have to challenge one another to reverse roles and see if you can you can play the others. Um, but, but similarly, the UK has played uh, sort of a, a moderating role in terms of, I mean, I can see it most clearly in NATO um, that, that they're very pragmatic, they're very proactive, they put forward a lot of initiatives and, and sort of drive an agenda in the same way you're talking about this German-French motor or a Polish-French motor or whatever it is um, um, driving various agendas. What do you think might be lost when the UK leaves the European Union? And how do we protect the future security relationship with the UK to, to keep the good parts? Um, you need to see that every enlargement gave the European Union a dimension it didn't have previously. When uh, the Eastern European states uh, joined the European Union, they brought with them uh, uh, their experience uh, with uh, Soviet Russia, uh, their experience uh, of an international organization uh, uh, where there were no partners uh, um, uh, and where there was uh, um, a steep, uh, shall we say, uh, can you say decline of, well, uh, huge differences between uh, partners. When uh, Spain and Greece uh, uh, joined the European Union, they brought uh, their experience uh, with the uh, southern Mediterranean uh, and northern Africa uh, and so forth. So if Britain uh, leaves the European <coughs> Union, um, it will take one dimension. It had brought the, uh, to the European Union too, and that is uh, its global experience, its global outlook, uh, its way uh, of dealing um, uh, and handling the economy, it's free trading uh, trade. All of that will not be completely lost because it, it has brought that to the European Union, but something will be lost. It will probably somehow alter uh, um, balances within the European Union in ways that are difficult to predict today. Um, but um, it will remain the closest partner along with the United States we have uh, outside of the European Union. Um, 
cooperation within NATO will stay the same. We'll uh, have to develop a relationship uh, in security, in academia, in, uh, in economic affairs with, the, uh, um, uh, with Great Britain, which will replace what we have today, uh, but will be as close uh, as we can possibly uh, conceive it. So yes, uh, there will be, um, uh, we'll lose something, um, but we will replace it uh, within NATO and bilaterally uh, in a way uh, uh, that uh, uh, will benefit uh, the relationship. Yes. Um, uh, to lose such an important member state as the U United Kingdom is, is a loss for everybody. It's clear. And it's, it's, it's a loss for the European Union as such, of course. Uh, but it was a decision taken by the United Kingdom. So we have uh, negotiated the withdrawal agreement. Now it's up to us, to the UK and the European Union, to negotiate the future relation and the defense and security dimension, together with the economic trade dimension, together with the uh, internal security um, um, movement of people, Dimension. Those w will be probably the most important items. Um, and we, um, from a French perspective, of course, you, you know we have a, a, a strong bilateral relation with the, the, the UK um, for different historical reasons and also military reasons. And we, um, um, our president proposed before the last uh, European elections. Um, to keep very strong relations between the EU and the UK as uh, not being a, not being any more member of the Euro European Union. Um, so it will depend on the negotiating positions of uh, all of us, but uh, as I said, we have to negotiate it in a way which um, ensures the maximum benefit for all of us, and uh, both the UK and the European Union, of course. Excellent. I might uh, turn back to the U.S. for a moment here. I'm keeping an eye on the time, so we have some, some moments for audience Q&A, but we still have a bit of time. Um, so when I look at, at what I think has changed in recent years in, in sort of U.S. foreign policy, there does seem to be an increasing linkage between economics and foreign policy. So for example, we see the use increasingly of sanctions, not just to punish or, or deter bad behavior, but also to pressure allies and partners to change their policies. Two recent examples would be um, sanctions on Nord Stream 2 on the companies who are involved there, or even on um, companies working with Iran now that JCPOA is, is, is under threat and the U.S. has pulled out. Do you see this blending of economics and foreign policy as problematic, and, and if so, why? Um, um, I think uh, sanctions um, are a necessary instrument of uh, diplomacy. I think that the strongest form of diplomatic language that you have, and that's why you need them. Um, the problem with sanctions is uh, that uh, their uh, efficiency and their impact will depend on uh, whether other, others go along with you, whether you have allies in magnifying the effect and the message and the language, um, it will depend on whether you try to achieve something or punish something. Obviously, if a sanction is punitive, uh, then the actor uh, that is being targeted uh, will draw different uh, conclusions for future behavior uh, than uh, uh, if it is linked to incentives and off-ramps. Mm -hmm. So these are a lot of uh, uh, questions. If um, sanctions become um, um, a primary instrument and vehicle uh, of diplomacy, I think it is inevitable that it, uh, they will lose uh, their long-term uh, uh, relevance because mechanisms will evolve that will circumvent them. Um, if you muddy, uh, 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 muddy uh, the language and message uh, by targeting adversaries and allies alongside, uh, people will ask, uh, uh, start to uh, question uh, whether ad hoc um, alliances um, uh, uh, on sanctions uh, uh, are the right decision to take. So um, to cut a long 
uh, answer short is sanctions are necessary. Uh, they depend uh, on uh, the clearest language possible, which means they need to be targeted. The targeted actor needs to see a way out. They need to be tied to off-ramps. Uh, they're best if they're linked to future behavior. Sometimes uh, you need to put a price tag, obviously, to past behavior. I see that. But never forget uh, that sanctions alone, without a way out, uh, will probably not change the behavior uh, that you want to uh, uh, change. And uh, make a difference between allies and uh, uh, those um, who are not. Because if you don't make a difference, uh, uh, you'll undermine the instrument in the long run. I don't know whether economy and uh, diplomacy have ever been completely separated. <laughs> Just been more subtle about it in the past. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But your question is very relevant. I completely agree with uh, Emily. We sanctions can be a useful instrument and are used by the European Union as such, by the way. But it's a difficult instrument in terms of exit strategy and efficiency. But we, we have to accept and to use it as, f as far as it is necessary. One thing which is, of course, of concern is what we call the um, extraterritorial effects of sanctions. And when they hit, uh, allies in a, as a secondary effect. And I feel we should have more consultations in case this, such things could happen. And this is uh, obviously uh, a necessity um, um, if you want uh, to clearly answer no to your question. Yeah. Okay. So I think I will turn it over to the audience because we're there just about at the hour. strong pressure. And I'm looking around and I'm seeing a good mix of, you know, foreign and security policy types, folks who work energy, climate. So I will, uh, I will try to mix it up. The gentleman over here in the orange-ish tie. Please inter introduce yourself before you ask your question. There's someone coming with the mic as well. Hello, um, David Little with uh, the media. Basically, my question is about uh, some of the members of the EU backsliding democratically. Um, Hungary has been bandied about and Poland for beginning to take on more authoritarian uh, views, and I wanted to hear your opinion on how you can manage that in the coming future. Will you connect languages? Um, I think we still have time to um, maybe answer each question okay. in turn. Um, the new commission um, has made uh, um, uh, democracy uh, and uh, the issue of democratic pushback and rule of law, one of its priorities. And as I said, uh, the Commission program uh, <coughs> was consulted in uh, every single capital, so that is not uh, in a way, uh, uh, in any way polarizing, but is, uh, is reflecting uh, the shared sense uh, that this is necessary. Also, um, um, following up on a friend on the proposal uh, of uh, President, President Macron, we will have a, um, um, a European conf uh, conference on, on the, the, future, on of the Europe. future of Europe, which will start under the German president's, uh, presidency and uh, end in 2022. Uh, um, under the French uh, presidency, uh, where member states, uh, where the commission, where the parliament, where also individual citizens will take uh, a part. Now, this so looks like a very introspective uh, exercise, but as Europe evolves uh, and as the environment evolves, uh, this is a process where we actually um, will distill um, a shared sense of narrative, uh, of what we are, of identity. So I think that conference uh, will play a huge role uh, in defining uh, what we want to be and where we want, uh, where we are uh, going to head. I'm not sure I understood the question. It was a question on Hungary. Democratic backsliding yeah, okay. in general. It, how, so how that's problematic. Well, the answers for the future are 
uh, in the answer of Emily. Uh, for the time being, of course, we have a, a, a sort of a, a gap between um, what is uh, the process of, for a country which, is, uh, which will become a member of the EU and when for the countries who are inside the EU without any difference between categories of member states because we must avoid absolutely to make uh, divides between East and West, be be newer and older member states, South and North. This is really um, to, avo to be avoided. But f considering all member states, all those who are in the European Union, when there are such discussions, there is only a very um, broad provision in the treaty, the famous artic Article 7, and no, no other way of um, handling such issues. The, 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 the way we have handled it until now, which is a good way, it is a collegial way, a discussions between the, the, the countries. But, um, and here I join what uh, Emily said, um, it's, we, we, we in the European Union, we share much more than an internal market or economic union. We share uh, values and uh, things which are really at the, at, at the base of our European Union. So it is normal that it is one thing which must be discussed among us. And in the process of reflecting on the future of European Union, it will necessarily come uh, as a matter of political discussion bet between our countries. I think you both, t to this point, I think you both made um, important points at the outset about addressing the democratic deficit. A lot of people are happy to blame the European Union when things are going wrong, but don't necessarily give it credit uh, when, when it's protecting citizens against different, different problems. So that may be a big part of, of addressing this as well. I think I'll take the two right here in the front, just to economize. <laughs> Um, thank you, Piotr, from the um, completely disunited kingdom. Um, I'm actually getting a petition going to uh, rename it that. Um, but Ambassador Heber, it's a pleasure to listen to you again, and Ambassador Etienne, pleasure to listen to you for the first time. Um, so in nine days' time, the UK is going to make the worst decision it's made in whoa, a long time. And it makes me uh, boiled to the core that I'm not going to be able to be a part of the EU uh, as a citizen under my own free will as a person who supports the EU. Um, so, so my concern is is that this is going to drastically change the security dynamic. Uh, the UK, the France, the big three, along with the United States, uh, represent a, a certain core, I think, for security ways that isn't perhaps considered enough um, beyond the purely Atlantic relationship. And uh, with us trying to hash out a trade deal within 10 months, I'm concerned that the security partnership that the UK and the EU negotiates is going to be extremely diluted. So I'd be interested to know how you think we can minimize forming quite a weak security partnership, because I think it's going to be. And on a side note, I would be interested to hear your thoughts on uh, Trump's comments that the EU is harder to deal with than China over trade. Thank you. Do, uh, we wanna, do you want to take oh, the sorry. other and then you can, you can the advantage yes, of this I approach try. is you can, you can choose I'm the ones that, that you'd like to answer. So I think I, if I understood sure your I understood. Qu question properly. It's a controversial, um, it's just a joke question, don't have to answer. No, not really, but you were talking about the, the future relationship with the EU and how security, yes. however important, important it is, may be lost as things get difficult on the negotiating the future aspect. trade relationship. Yeah. Um, and then... The, of course, the, the trick question the about trick question. the U.S. comments on uh, on the EU being harder to negotiate with than when the, with than China, which could be actually taken as a compliment. I think <laughs> I think it, I think it is a compliment. Yes. yes. And a sign of respect. <laughs> yes. So the second question, and then we'll turn it over to our guests. So I'm um, Andrea Shalal with Reuters. Nice to see you both. Um, I want to piggyback on that question because I think it's very much on people's minds given that Davos is going on and there's a lot of um, wrangling going on about digital taxes. Um, the U.S. has now you know, agreed a truce with France on the digital tax issue, but uh, Britain is saying, no, we're going to go ahead with our digital tax, which 
basically sort of drew a response from Treasury Secretary Mnuchin in Davos saying, well, then we might just arbitrarily put tariffs on you. So I wanted to ask you both if you have advice for your colleagues in, the, in, in Britain in terms of you've been under threat of tariffs in the EU for quite a while. Um, what, what advice do you have and what is your prognosis for these various pots of tariffs that have been threatened? Car tariffs seem to be back on the agenda after having disappeared. There's still wine tariffs in place, wine and, and, and other goods um, in place, aircraft. Uh, there is a threat that those could be increased if you don't solve the Airbus uh, problem or the aircraft subsidy problem. And uh, yes, so still in aluminum. There are lots of tariffs in place, but what advice do you have for the UK and what's your prognosis for solving these trade issues and getting to some kind of an agreement between Brussels and the EU and, and the US? Okay, well, for, to make a change, I will, uh, I will start. Uh, I'm not sure I got everything from the, the questions, but uh, <laughs> those were complex questions anyway. Um, <coughs> um, I will start with the second one to say that uh, I have no advice to give uh, to anybody else, of course, but I would, you mentioned two d different, different uh, disputes or different processes with uh, with uh, tariffs, and I, I think that uh, on 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 both the uh, French digital tax issue, which is also a European discussion, uh, as you know, we had, uh, and we have we we have discussions at the level of the EU about uh, digital taxation. But both on this issue and on the Airbus Boeing issue, what we say on the European side is that the best solution is to have a settlement based on uh, international frameworks and bilateral discussions. Airbus Boeing, we have, uh, it is something which is, has been, or is being decided in the framework of the WTO. Now, our interest, the interest of our aircraft industries, but also of other branches which have been uh, hit by tariffs on the American side is, of course, to settle the issue uh, on the, the original issue, which is subsidies to aircraft industries, and not to have an accumulation of tariffs, which will harm economies on both sides. On the, on the, on the taxation of digital activities, what we say it, Well, uh, you know, I cannot speak for others, uh, but uh, we, we have this process uh, both uh, about subsidies, the U.S. Sub subsidizing uh, Airbus and the U.S. subsidizing Boeing, as you know. And the two processes are not exactly in the same timetable. So our interest, our common interest with the U.S. is, of course, uh, well, we say of course because it seems to be some to be something obvious that we have to settle it and to, to look to the future. It's, uh, what is not in our interest is to have uh, this addition of tariffs. This is the only thing I, I can say. On, on the taxation of digital activities, what we say is uh, also that we need an international regulation, an international rule. It happens that there is a negotiation in the framework of the OECD this time. We need it. Of course, because it's difficult. It's it's also a question of democracy in in, in our countries. That uh, people, some people pay taxes and some others do not pay taxes while they, they make money. We recognize it is a difficult issue because the digital economy changes the, the economy altogether. But we have to uh, agree on something, and this something ideally must be an international rule. So this is really our answer. If our parliaments in Europe or in other places uh, put taxes in place, of course, um, this is also because there is this, um, this, uh, also this pressure from, from taxpayers uh, about a fair, ta which we want a fair taxation. But it is obvious here too that the only 
a satisfactory solution and sustainable solution is to have a, 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 a rule and we as France and in the EU also we support this very much. Um, on, on, on the first question, it was about security in the UK and the loss of security. Yes, well, I, we have three levels. We have NATO, which, as Emily said, remains uh, with the UK, France, Germany, and the US. We have uh, our bilateral relations as I mentioned, between France and the UK. We have a strong bilateral relations in the field. And we have the next step, which will be the negotiation of arrangements of, of treaties between the UK and the European Union, also in this field. So altogether, if we are, um, if we are uh, efficient, of course there is the risk of a, a loss of consistency, but I think it is in everybody's interest, in the British interest, but also in our interest, to build something which, on the basis of these three elements, will keep as much as possible the same level of security. Oh, this is different. This is a cooperation on foreign policy. As you could see, we remain coordinated between the UK, France, and Germany so far. So there is no reason to think that there would be some uh, loss of uh, coordination. We want to remain coordinated, of course. I want to re um, react to your question, not uh, because uh, I could give any advice, which I never do anyway, but because I want to offer an observation. There's a big difference, uh, and the difference is uh, uh, the European Union uh, and the United States economically uh, are on a par, or as strong as the United States is, which, with obvious uh, impact, uh, because we are so strong, on taxation and regulation and so forth. So um, that will always be something that will be factored in uh, um, in the negotiations, because uh, should we be targeted uh, with additional tariffs, we'll react as we did uh, in the past, uh, and we'll react in the same dimension uh, and in uh, uh, in the same vein, and this will define the relationship. I don't think this is applicable on other cases. All right, we have a lot of questions and not <coughs> really time for all of them. I see one in the back here who's had a hand up for a while and then on the far corner. Could we take those two and see how we do on time? Hello, uh, I'm Austin Doler with the uh, Penn Bind Center. My question is for, for Ambassador Aubert specifically. Uh, you mentioned in your initial remarks about strategic competition with Russia and China, but yet there are some, especially in the U.S., who argue that Germany, by cooperating with or pursuing Huawei with China or Nord Stream 2 with Russia potentially leaves the West vulnerable to some extent in this strategic competition. How would you respond to that sentiment? Thank you. Well, uh, on China, uh, it's obvious to me that China is many things. China is um, a systemic rival insofar as it pursues different uh, governance uh, 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 models. It is an um, uh, economic competitor and political competitor, and in some areas it is a partner. Think of uh, peacekeeping, for example, uh, or think on is uh, of issues like climate change, uh, uh, where you will not make any headway without uh, involving China. So China is all of that. Uh, um, you seem to frame your question in a way that uh, as if Germany viewed China only as a partner, which is obviously not the case. We see all of its aspects uh, uh, as we all uh, should, and we do realize uh, that uh, the intense Chinese investment, like a Belt and Road Initiative, uh, uh, is a long-term strategy uh, designed uh, to encourage or coerce political behavior. Uh, we see the investment in critical infrastructure and can easily uh, uh, draw the conclusion what this will mean uh, for, um, uh, um, for foreign policy uh, leeway. So it's more complex than you seem to indicate, and I can assure you that security issues uh, always loom large. And I say that as someone who has dealt uh, intensely with security uh, over the past years. 
if, if I may add a word on the relations with Russia and China, it's also more and more uh, a matter for the EU as such, and it is good, because uh, if the EU wants to be relevant for its citizens yes. and for its policies, it has to take into account this uh, increasing uh, importance of the relations to China. And we see in the last month um, um, an increasing involvement of uh, Europe, of the European as such, which has uh, published policy papers which were not, have not remained unnoticed. And um, just following that, uh, and with the prejudice of the initiatives of the next German presidency of the European Union, uh, which I'm sure will be very active on this level. We will have. We, we also had summit. a meeting um, during the last state visit by the Chinese president to France, where our president invited the German chancellor, the then president of the European Commission, together with the Chinese president, so to establish also this dialogue at the at the level of the EU, which is also something quite new, uh, which seems to me to be important for the EU. Uh, as such, and also for uh, the conversation we have with the Chinese uh, on very, very sensitive, but also very important topics for all of us. Excellent answers. All right, one more over here, and then I think we have to let these guys. Thank you. My name is Susan Fratsky, and I'm with the Migration Policy Institute. And um, together with my colleagues in Brussels, we've been following the developments around the common European asylum system and conversations around Schengen reform. Um, and I particularly appreciated Ambassador's, uh, Ambassador Haber's comments at the beginning about the potential that some of these crises have brought to strengthen European governance, as well as, of course, the you know, questions around loss of confidence and those sorts of things. Um, and I think as part of our work, we've seen uh, sort of an opportunity come up under the new commission uh, and, of course, the upcoming um, German and then later uh, French presidencies to breathe some new life into the conversations around Schengen reform and this EAS and to maybe move past some of the controversies um, from the last few years around Dublin and, and these sorts of things where there was no progress. Um, so I'm curious as to both of your views about what may be possible in the next, uh, the next few years under the new commission and your presidencies, particularly around some of these continuously vexed issues about disembarkation platforms, what happens at the external borders of the union, um, and also uh, questions around uh, sort of how do you make, uh, how do you, how do you, get everyone to um, play the same game within Schengen and make sure that they're fulfilling their responsibilities. Thank you. Um, it was my feeling uh, that the migration crisis uh, um, was more divisive uh, even than the Euro crisis. I might be wrong and might be subjective uh, uh, view of someone who dealt closely with it. Uh, I felt it was indicative of, well, you see, Migration is always also about identity, so it really um, goes, um, goes deep. Hmm? Um, when Schengen was decided, it was clear to everyone, I believe, uh, that in the long run it would mean uh, that um, external border protection would have to function uh, and uh, that you would need uh, um, uh, homogeneous asylum systems. If one part of uh, this uh, uh, equation uh, doesn't function anymore, um, um, then you'll have a problem. And this is what happened when external border control uh, um, practically collapsed uh, for a couple of months uh, or a year even uh, in 2015. Then it became blatantly obvious uh, that the asylum system was not homogeneous and that people could decide uh, uh, where they wanted to go, uh, and the Dublin system uh, was uh, uh, was uprooted in that way, and that disconnect still is relevant. Uh, we've s we've seen the proof of it. Uh, until the migration crisis, we lived uh, with some sort of uh, self delusion uh, because uh, the countries of first entry claimed uh, that they were carrying most burden because people arrived there, and the countries uh, where people then actually moved on to uh, claimed um, that the Dublin system uh, should work. But you see, because of the disconnect of the three elements, uh, um, this was uh, completely uh, 
um, uh, um, disclosed as delusion uh, during the migration crisis. It remains uh, um, a challenge uh, and it is uh, an issue that will uh, remain on the table, but it will take time uh, and uh, there will be, um, I guess, uh, uh, it will keep us busy uh, over the next years because it's um, a highly divisive issue in Europe still. I agree with that and the, the reform of the Dublin regulation. I've, I've been working on this less okay. intense, with less intensity than Emily in Germany in 2015. But uh, during the last years I spent in Brussels, in Paris and in between in Berlin, I see that this is a, such a sensitive question and we have to end it carefully. But on the other end, the people do not understand our citizens that we cannot regulate it properly. So uh, it will be one of the most uh, difficult tests for the new European institutions, but we, we must really find a solution on, on the different dimensions. Okay. All right, well with that, I think our time is up, but I really appreciated all your excellent answers as well as your opening comments. Uh, I want to take us back to that positivity that you, that you projected at the beginning where you pointed out that although there may be bumps or disagreements or, or nuances in our, in our views, our interests and values are, are still aligned, whether that's France and Germany or the EU and the UK or transatlantic. Um, and that we may see an evolution of the systems and we just need to keep talking and, and use what we have. So I appreciate the positivity and the excellent answers and thanks to the audience.